Well, now I'm very pleased to talk to Professor Angela Gallup, who's just finished her little lecture here. And An Angela has such an interesting career. Uh, you're one of the world's most eminent forensic scientists and, uh, <laughs> and have worked on all sorts of things, including uh, miscarriages like the Cardiff Three and uh, in cases like the killings of Stephen Lawrence and Damiola Taylor, for, to name but a few. Serious stuff there, Angela. Um, yes, I suppose so, but I've been working in the field for a very long time, I mean, 45 years now, so it's hardly surprising, I suppose, that you know, I've had an opportunity to work on some uh, of we, we, we ought to mention, of course, the book is called When the Dogs Don't Bark, which is a great insight into what you do, really, isn't it? Well, yes, I mean, the, the title is really meant to um, illustrate the subtleties of forensic science, because I was, I was writing it for a number of reasons, really, but partly so that people understand what real forensic science is like, as opposed to the stuff that you see on television in the films, which is great entertainment, and I uh, don't decry it, but, um, but is not like real life. And I think the title came because I was thinking of, well, you know, links with forensic science, you know, you, you can liken that to dogs barking, but sometimes, you know, when you've got a positive link, but sometimes where you haven't got a link and you'd expect one, um, that can be just as informative, and so that's uh, equivalent to dogs not barking, and so that's how it came about. <laughs> <laughs> Very good too. Um, I think Isle of Wight has an important part of your life. Yes, my, uh, my career, certainly my early career, um, Isle of Wight was very central to that. Uh, there came a time when I was doing, um, uh, I'd been to university and then I was doing a research degree wondering what I was going to do next. Um, and I was uh, investigating the biochemistry of sea slugs. And the sea slug I was interested in um, is only found on the Isle of Wight. And I think there's one other site up in Scotland somewhere. So the Isle of Wight was incredibly important. And I remember with great fondness lots of trips over in my Fiat 500 in those days amongst all these big lorries on the ferry. Um, collecting these, uh, you know, a few, a few specimens of these slugs and the seaweed that they lived on, um, and of course lots of proper seawater for them to live in, and so that was um, that gave me a great memories of the Isle of Wight. It's still quite away from sea slugs to what you do now. Yes, but they were helpful actually in making me see that um, life as a pure scientist was never going to work for me. I mean, I think for my research there were probably only about six or seven people around the world who would be interested in what I was uh, discovering. And I realised that I needed a far larger audience for my efforts and I needed to be immediately important to people. And so it was obviously going to be an applied science job. And it was a friend of mine, actually, who was at the same, in the same position as I was. He was writing up his, um, his thesis, his PhD thesis, and he came across the library one day and said, hey, Angela, you've been belly aching about, you know, what you're going to do next. Here's a job in the Forensic Science Service that might just suit you. So actually, it's thanks to him that, <laughs> that I've had these last 45 years as I have. Um, without being specific, I suppose, but you know, you've worked on so many famous cases. What, what ones stand out for you? I think there are many of them that stand out for different reasons, but I suppose the one, one of the ones that I really, um, I don't know if you can say you're fond of a case, but you know, <laughs> yes. well, the equivalent anyway, um, is the Coastal Path murder. And that was really partly because it was such a difficult case to do. Not, not so much in terms of scientific terms, although it certainly was far from straightforward, but because the police, it's a small rural force, David Powers, who was responsible for investigating this dreadful crime and other, there was another double murder and there was a, um, there was a sexual assault of two young women um, in a party of five at gunpoint, so there was awful things happening in that part of the country. Um, and the force didn't, but didn't have very much money to spend on reinvestigating this old case, the coastal path. And so um, they said, could we just focus on DNA? And we did that, and that was quite difficult. The coastal path victims, Gwenda and Peter Dixon, weren't their bodies weren't found for about a week after they died, which gave us some technical problems. Um, but anyway, I didn't realise just how uh, you know how bad things were getting in the force until the investigator rang me up one day and said, Angela, you're complete rubbish. You've been trying to find DNA. You've been failing. I'm going to take this case off you and give it to someone else. And I said, No, no, no. Let me come and speak to you. And I remember going down there where I had a very difficult meeting with the force. They were uniformly hostile, which is not normally what happens. Normally it's a team effort, you know. 
But I explained that I thought what we ought to do is look for a far broader range of traces, and particularly textile fibres, which form part of all the clothing that everybody wears, and are great indicators and good evidence in their own right of where people have, you know, people have been in contact with one another, particularly violent contact. And so eventually I managed to persuade them to give us a little bit more latitude and a little bit more time, and almost immediately we started finding um, links, textile fibre links, between this chap that the new investigator in Diffid Powers had got in mind. He was a chap who was in prison um, for other violent offences and thought to be capable of these sorts of crimes too. Almost immediately we started finding links, indirect links, and then direct links with him. And through the fibres we found some blood which gave us those big DNA statistics and gave us that golden nugget of independent evidence which is what the investigator had originally been asking for. So I think it's partly because of all the difficulties in that case as well as the fantastic result which is why I'm uh, particularly fond of it. Um, you just mentioned budgets and, and well the police and, and forces are under extreme budget uh, strengths I suppose. Is that the same in, in your neck of the woods as it were? Absolutely and it's another reason for writing the book to highlight the dangers um, of what's happening in forensic science at the moment and um, particularly the fact that it's been it's all about saving money and I've got nothing there's nothing wrong with that you know you have to do things as cheaply and quickly as you possibly can obviously any part of public um, public services like that but the problem is that forensic science has been now so commoditized to a series of simple tests that we're forgetting how to link them all up together and we're forgetting some of the skills are being de-skilled some of the more expensive areas but that can give you amazing results and maybe shortcut a lot of other things you know including some big things like reinvestigations and public inquiries if you solve the crime as quickly as you can then it sorts out all of that sort of expense um, and so I'm very nervous that the police are increasingly um, either doing stuff themselves which I worry about because it's really difficult however good they are um, to provide convincing, impartial, independent evidence if you're also involved in the organisation that hunts criminals. Um, but also because it's very difficult to do anything half difficult by saying I'll have six of that test and two of the other and hope we hit on something useful because that's not going to get you there. Yeah, very much so. Well, you mentioned television. Um, my memories would be, you know, like someone like Sherlock Holmes and you see him portrayed as he goes into a room and sees everything that other people don't. Does that happen to you? Do you, when you go to a scene, do you see things others don't? Well, I should hope that I and my colleague, <laughs> colleagues, you know, um, understand very well, um, you know, have a good chance of getting to grips with crime scenes. I mean, that's really essential because that is the place where all forensic science starts, obviously. Um, and it's really, really important. I've discovered over the years, and especially doing these really complicated cases and old cases, it's really important to go back to the crime scene because by understanding the sequence of events, you know, what happened there, that's what tells you what your forensic opportunities are. And forensic scientists should be really good at that. They should be very observant about things. Um, and that tells you what to collect and what to examine first and how to examine it. Um, and all the rest of it. So I'm not sure that we do it exactly like Sherlock Holmes did, and, but we certainly, um, I think we certainly have a great part to play at crime scenes, and, um, and it's really important that we continue to be involved in them. Very much so. Well, I could talk to you all day, Angela, because it's a fascinating subject, and you're a real-life investigative forensic scientist. It's just amazing. Uh, well, the book's called When the Dogs Don't Bark by Professor Angela Gallup, and uh, best of luck with the book. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.